Hello, I'm Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'll be discussing Bichette's syndrome, also known as Bichette's disease. Bichette's syndrome is a chronic, systemic, inflammatory condition of unknown etiology and with diverse manifestations that partially manifests as a vasculitis, unique for its involvement of arteries and veins of all sizes. The syndrome's single most defining clinical characteristic is recurrent, painful, mucocutaneous ulcers. Regarding its clinical presentation, it typically presents between the ages of 20 and 40. Although I don't typically discuss epidemiology in this series on underappreciated diseases, this is warranted with Bichette's syndrome because of the huge difference in prevalence based on geography and ethnicity. It's been called the Silk Road disease due to higher disease prevalences seen in countries along the so-called Silk Road that was a collection of ancient trading routes stretching from Southern Europe and Northern Africa to East Asia. For example, Turkey has the world's highest prevalence of around 300 cases per 100,000 people, which is literally 100 times what it is in some Northern European countries. Among common clinical features, the one that comes closest to being universal is painful oral and genital ulcers. These ulcers are the most common presenting symptom and can initially appear similar to conventional canker sores and usually last for only several days at a time. Genital ulcers most commonly occur on the scrotum in males and on the major and minor labia in females and typically last several weeks. Although genital ulcers typically only occur in the first several years in the course of the disease, they can result in scarring. Bichette's is associated with a very wide variety of skin manifestations. Acne-like eruptions, pseudofilliculitis, and erythema nodosum are the most common of these. However, erythema multiforme, pyoderma gangrenosum, palpable purpura, and superficial thrombophlebitis can all occur as well. Ocular disease occurs in about half of patients. This usually manifests as either posterior uveitis or panuveitis. Retinal vasculitis can also occur. Patients can experience an asymmetric oligoarticular arthritis affecting the medium to large joints, such as the knees, ankles, and wrists. A variety of vascular lesions are a significant cause of mortality. Unlike most forms of vasculitis, veins are more commonly affected than arteries. Manifestations of this can include conventional deep vein thromboses, as well as the thrombosis of the hepatic veins, known as Bud Chiari syndrome, cerebral venous sinuses, and the superior and inferior vena cava. When arteries are affected, the patient can develop aneurysms. Pulmonary artery aneurysms are an uncommon but relatively specific feature of Bichette's. In addition to these most common manifestations, neurologic complications are well described and also an important cause of Bichette's related morbidity and mortality. Neural manifestations include encephalitis, cranial nerve palsies, ataxia, and myelopathy. GI manifestations are also less common, but can include abdominal pain, diarrhea, and GI bleeding. When present, GI pathology most commonly consists of ulcers found in the ileocecal region with a similar appearance to Crohn's disease. Lastly, patients with Bichette's can experience general symptoms of systemic inflammation, such as malaise, fatigue, and periodic fevers. While most multi-system diseases present differently in different patients, this appears to be even more apparent in Bichette's, so much so that the syndrome has recently been subdivided into multiple subtypes known as Bichette phenotypes. Not only do these phenotypes each have a distinct pattern of symptoms and signs, but they also have different epidemiology and different prognoses. Some occur when involvement of a single organ system predominates the clinical picture. For example, ocular Bichette's, intestinal Bichette's, and neurobichettes. In addition to this, however, studies have found three multi-system phenotypes in which a combination of specific features seem to occur at a much higher rate than what would be expected with chance alone. These include the mucocutaneous and articular phenotype, the most commonly recognized of the multi-system phenotypes, the one with the easiest treatment, and probably the best long-term prognosis. There is a parenchymal neurological and ocular phenotype in which the neurological manifestations include 
recurrent inflammatory encephalitis. And the last is the extraparenchymal neurological and peripheral vascular phenotype, the former half of which includes cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. The existence of distinct phenotypes is one argument in favor of calling this condition Bichette's syndrome rather than Bichette's disease because it is not yet established that there is a single pathophysiological process behind every presentation that currently meets a consensus for diagnosis. So how does one diagnose Bichette's syndrome? Bichette's is a clinical diagnosis. That means that it's usually diagnosed based solely on history and exam. There are no confirmatory tests, histology, or pathognomonic radiographic findings. The one diagnostic test that is the most associated with Bichette's is called the pathogy test. This is the development of a papule or pustule-like lesion 48 hours after skin prick by a 20-gauge needle. There is a set of diagnostic criteria for Bichette's syndrome. It consists of one required feature, recurrent idiopathic oral ulcers, with at least three episodes within a 12-month period, and at least two of the following four additional features. Recurrent genital ulcers, ocular disease, skin lesions consistent with Bichette's, such as those previously listed, and an abnormal pathogy test. Some experts also consider the presence of neurologic and or vascular manifestations to be syndrome-defining criteria as well. It's important to recognize that this criteria was developed for uniformity in scientific studies of patients with Bichette's. Even more so than with most diagnostic criteria for diseases and syndromes, it is not intended to be applied dogmatically to individual patients. In other words, patients can be diagnosed with Bichette's even if they don't strictly meet the criteria listed here. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of Bichette's, the main limiting factor in a correct diagnosis is familiarity with the condition. There are few, if any, other diagnoses that typically cause recurrent oral and genital ulcers, so it's not usually a diagnostic challenge. However, it can be a diagnostic challenge if the patient has an unusual presentation in which these ulcers are either not prominent or not yet present. In this situation, where the patient presents with some combination of inflammatory arthritis, skin lesions, uveitis, thromboses in unusual locations, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and neurologic problems, it can be mistaken for other diseases. Specific diagnoses which can be confused with the Bichette's include IBD, spondyloarthritis, lupus, and an autoimmune disease called reactive arthritis. Regarding treatment, because Bichette's has an unusually wide variety of presentations, the management needs to be individualized. Historically, the management of Bichette's in an individual patient was largely determined by the subjectively most severe individual manifestation. So, going through the common manifestations, for ulcers, acute treatment is topical steroids and prevention is with colchicine. Azathioprine can be used for refractory disease. Arthritis is managed with colchicine, plus or minus non-steroidal anti-inflammatory meds. Azathioprine and or TNF-alpha inhibitors are used for refractory disease. Most skin manifestations can be treated with topical steroids, plus colchicine, with prednisone used for refractory lesions. Dermatology referrals should be made for unusual lesions, such as pyoderma gangrenosum, as well as for anything refractory. Regarding ocular disease, in my opinion, it's dangerous and an all-round bad idea for a non-ophthalmologist to attempt primary management of any ocular manifestations of Bichette's, so patients should be referred to an ophthalmologist. Having said that, for posterior uveitis, which is much more common than anterior uveitis in Bichette's, systemic steroids and azathioprine are often used. For neurodisease, systemic steroids plus either azathioprine or another immunosuppressive medication. Vascular disease is managed with steroids or other immunosuppressive meds. Anticoagulation in vascular Bichette's is controversial and should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Surgery may be needed for aneurysms. And last, intestinal Bichette's is managed with a combination of sulfasalazine, prednisone, and or azathioprine with TNF-alpha inhibitors used for refractory disease. So this is what has generally been done with Bichette's management 
up until now. However, looking ahead at how treatment might evolve in the upcoming decades, it seems likely that rather than treating individual disease manifestations, growing recognition of distinct phenotypes will lead to paradigm shift to phenotype-specific management. And we can start to notice the phenotypes naturally falling out of grouping similar treatments together. This is not coincidence, but rather evidence for the existence of biologically distinct subtypes of the disease. For example, the treatment for the mucocutaneous and arthritis phenotype is very overlapping. The treatment for the parenchymal, neurological, and ocular phenotype is overlapping, as is the treatment for the extraparenchymal and vascular phenotype. Last, the treatment of intestinal bichettes is very similar to that for Crohn's disease. I'll end with prognosis. Bichette syndrome is characterized by exacerbations and remissions. Over years to decades, most symptoms improve, though significant morbidity may persist from neurologic and arterial vascular disease. About half of patients will eventually experience complete remission within about 20 years. Bichette's related mortality is relatively low, but the disease is most severe in patients who are young, male, and are of either Middle Eastern or East Asian descent. That concludes this brief introduction to Bichette's syndrome. If you found this to be interesting and helpful, please check out the rest of this series on underappreciated diseases and consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for more videos on medicine and medical education.